Welcome everyone to the third session of our lecture series, Historic House Museums Respond to Crisis. I am Sharon Small, the Director of Education here at Dumbarton House. Dumbarton House is a historic house museum located in Washington, D.C., and we're the headquarters of the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. We share stories about life in D.C. in the early 1800s through the life of Joseph Nurse, the first register of the treasury, as well as all the under other individuals who lived and worked at Dumbarton House, both free and enslaved over the years, as well as information about historic preservation and advances being made in the field. This is the third lecture in a six part series funded by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I encourage you all to sign up for the other sessions if you have not done so already, as we will be exploring new topics and institutions each week as we learn how historic house museums have been responding in the past year or so to the urgent needs created by climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, and social justice movements. Each session will be recorded and available on our YouTube page afterwards, but by being here during the live presentation, you get to ask our speakers all of your burning questions. Historic house museums rarely survive the decades untouched. They undergo many changes throughout their long histories, changes that speak to their inhabitants, their usages, and the stories they contain. But sometimes those changes obscure more than they reveal. In the wake of the unjust murder of George Floyd in May 2020, many in the preservation community began to confront issues of race and equity hiding in plain sight. The staff of the Nathaniel Russell House were making these discoveries even before 2020. Our speaker for today, Jay Graham Long, Director of Museums of the Historic Charleston Foundation, will share how new data was discovered at the Nathaniel Russell House in 2019. A rear outbuilding there, constructed in 1808, originally held a cook room, a laundry, and three living chambers for its enslaved people. It was said that mid 20th century renovations had destroyed all remnants of its original fabric. However, those beliefs were false. The historic Charleston Foundation peeled back modern materials to reveal original construction and new data once thought lost. These discoveries are at last providing crucial representation to the enslaved people who once toiled there. As Director of Museums for Historic Charleston Foundation, Graham leads all research, stewardship, interpretive, and education initiatives at the Nathaniel Russell House and Aiken Rett House Museums, and serves as curator for the extensive collections therein. He has authored three books, numerous articles, and lectured extensively throughout the Southeast on various topics concerning material culture, decorative arts, and social histories of South Carolina. The former chief curator for the Charleston Museum, he is the resident historian for the German Friendly Society, a member of the Mayor's Walled City Task Force, and an honorary member of the Washington Light Infantry. He is a volunteer curator for the Citadel Archives and Museum, and works as a historical consultant for the U.S. Air Force Explosive Ordnance Disposal. Thank you so much for being with us today, Graham. And let me stop sharing my screen so you can start sharing yours. I am certainly pleased uh, to be here and be uh, uh, speaking with, uh, with you, Sheridan, and, and the Dunbarton House. And I, I certainly really have been very excited about this for a very long time. Um, this is uh, my first uh, can we call it an appearance at Dunbarton House? I'm not sure that might work, uh, but I, I, it's, a, it's a thrilling invitation. Thank you for that introduction and greetings to all of you from sunny-ish, cloudy Charleston. I think uh, you may hear some thunderclaps behind me. We have uh, entered uh, what we call here the malaria days, which means pretty much what it sounds like. It's incredibly hot, it's incredibly humid, and uh, thunderstorms can kind of pop up at the least amount of, uh, with the least amount of warning. Nevertheless, uh, I am pleased to, um, uh, to to talk a little bit today about some of our ongoing, one of our major ongoing projects, um, which happened um, for us as in the, um, really sort of by accident in, in, in 2017 and 2018 uh, and really in earnest in 2019. Before I get into that though, let me share my screen and warning this is usually when presentations of mine go completely off the rails because I am still inconceivably illiterate. Um, 
when it comes to, oh, it worked. Okay. Did that work for uh, Sheridan? That, that's okay? Okay. Yes, that looks good. Um, so uh, founded uh, a little bit about the foundation where I work. Uh, founded in 1947, uh, Historic Charleston Foundation is a preservation advocacy organization uh, who also owns and operates two of uh, Charleston, South Carolina's most iconic historic houses, uh, or house museums, maybe I should say. The Aiken Rett House, which was constructed circa 1820, and the Nathaniel Russell House, constructed circa 1808, where most of our attention will be paid this morning. Uh, my job is to, uh, as, as Sheridan said, my, to uh, oversee the preservation administration interpretation of these crucial historic properties. Now, a total re-examination for us in um, uh, as far as um, a look into the reinterpretation of our sites in an effort to tell the whole story. Um, of not just the big house, but obviously, or the main house, uh, but also the, the lives and work of the enslaved associated with these properties. For that, uh, it, it begins with Historic Charleston Foundation. It actually begins very early, early than some people would really guess, particularly at our Aiken Red House. Um, the Aiken Red House, um, uh, for us, that interpretation and that incorporation begins uh, for us in the late 1990s. And the reason for that is we had two things uh, working very much in our favor. First of all, um, the family is there in the house uh, from about 1830 until 1985. So Sheridan, you had mentioned that there was uh, a lot, oftentimes a lot of movement and, 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 and goings on in these houses uh, that, that alters them in sometimes irreparable ways. This is just where we got lucky. Uh, we, uh, that, that the family was always there. It does not go through a lot of movement. It does not go through a lot of adaptations and renovations and teardowns and whatever else. Uh, hurricanes left it more or less alone. I won't say completely alone. Um, but the family's there uh, through, throughout uh, the 19th and the 20th century. And because of that, this house is preserved as is. So with the family being there and having a lot, not a lot of um, intrusive work done to it, the house has remained relatively un intact um, throughout the course of its life. And this is also uh, goes for the outbuildings. Um, the kitchen and laundry, uh, which you see on the right side of your screen, and then the carriage and stable, which you see on the left side, uh, on the on the ground floors anyway, and then the quarters uh, up above, um, are all uh, very much um, uh, left alone for the most part. Uh, very few alterations over the years, and um, uh, we've done extensive research on you know the lime wash paint, the architectural features, um, and we're and and done uh, a lot of social histories on those folks, uh, those uh, enslaved individuals uh, who were there uh, trying to find descendants, which we have found um, over the years and um, have helped us in the reinterpretation of this space. Um, this is an audio tour home, as is our Nathaniel Russell House. Uh, we are app based these days, and to really sort of culminate our research on these sites. We, um, uh, when we developed our app a couple of years ago, uh, we rewrote the language uh, to make sure uh, that the, um, the goings on of both of these properties was incorporated in pretty much every single room. You're not gonna hear just about the enslaved if you're in the enslaved spaces. You're not gonna hear just about the main family if you're in the enslaved spaces either. There's a whole working gear here uh, or, or that we try to examine a, an entire, um, inner workings uh, of this entire property as it would have been uh, at the time that the families with their enslaved are there. So um, that's our Aiken Red House. Now, like I said, we got lucky uh, with Aiken Red and the fact that a lot of primary documentation was still intact. The family had not left and they had just kind of lived there hitting the pause button. So uh, again, we preserved this house as is. At Nathaniel Russell House, we were not that lucky. Uh, we acquired this house in 1955. It had gone through several different family ownerships. It was a school at one point um, uh, run by the Sisters of Mercy, the Catholic school at one point run by the Sisters of Mercy. Uh, and so it had, had undergone a lot of alterations, changes, restorations, and just a lot of, I won't call it damage, but it was um, a, a lot of, well, just, just rigmarole 
So that is where we as the foundation really had to sort of pick. And this house is a complete 180 turn perhaps from our Aiken Red House. This is not preserved as it is. Uh, we use this house as a preservation laboratory. We uh, spare no expense and no time. Um, uh, or, or, or no, we don't try to, you know, and we spend a lot of time uh, with paint analysis, gender, chrono gender chronology, making sure uh, to restore and study this house back to uh, as close as we can get to what I've come to call, you know, move in day. Um, so for those of you unacquainted with the Nathaniel Russell House, it is widely considered one of America's uh, most important neoclassical townhouses. I am tooting my own horn here a little bit, if you forgive me, but it is replete with a three-story free-flying cantilevered staircase, uh, an exceptional collection of fine and decorative art. It was built in 1808 for Nathaniel Russell, uh, a Rhode Island-born merchant who became one of Charleston's most prolific slave traders. Uh, by the late colonial period. Um, it's open to the public, uh, or as has been since 1955. It's been through, as I said, several generations of study and, and, and restoration, uh, multiple projects uh, focused on documentary research and forensic analysis, uh, all of which today form the bedrock of our understanding of this, of this space. Now, as I said, the discussion today will, will focus not on the main house, uh, but it's surviving outbuilding the kitchen and laundry. And of course, sad to say, uh, the main house has traditionally been, and I think you run into this a lot at house museums, especially in the last 20 to 30 years, uh, the main house has traditionally been the center of attention for most of its tourable museum life. Uh, what was originally the kitchen, laundry, uh, and three upstairs quarters for the enslaved was not what you would say at the forefront of mid 20th century thinking. In effect, uh, the main house uh, was further prepared for its transition, uh, excuse me, not the main house, the, the outbuilding, the kitchen house, which we just saw. Um, this space was uh, prepared for transition into a museum property, um, a secondary space like this, and again, not unique, uh, as far as what happened to it. Uh, but we're renovated, worked over, uh, converted into offices uh, by uh, what my predecessor so delicately described as a savage 20th century gut job, uh, ha ha had robbed it of any of its architectural merit. At least that's what we thought. And that was the collective belief. Uh, uh, this was a this was a 1970s 1980s gut job or 1960s even that just sort of got renovated over and over and over again uh, to the point where it was uh, a place um, our gift shop was there at one point there were offices on the second floor at one point um, uh, it was a visitor reception and, and where you would meet your docent to to go on your tour so. Um, that is kind of where we so really what i'm getting at is no there was um, sadly not it did not warrant or at least the collective belief was whatever used to be there it's a lost cause it's not worth the effort it's not worth the money and we certainly don't have the time to go on some wild goose chase when we are sure we're positive that everything in here had just been completely destroyed and worked over and that was the end of that we were very very wrong and wrong in a fantastic way uh, it begins uh, for us, as, as many maybe projects in the museum business often do, uh, with a little more than a passing skeptical thought. Uh, sitting, and I'm speaking of my predecessor very fondly, her name was Lauren Northup. She, was a, she still remains a very close friend of mine. Um, but she was in this chair uh, back when I was with the Charleston Museum. Uh, she has moved on to another organization and uh, because of my close relationship with HCF over the many, many years of being in Charleston, I decided it's a nice chair. What the heck? I'll take it. <laughs> and so it was a kind of a, a movement in that regard. But in any case, um, so Lauren sitting at her desk in the, her office um, uh, used to be over the Nathaniel Russell House. I'm about two blocks away now. Um, Lauren was sitting in, uh, in her office and looking up from her work, just so happened to notice the unremarkable kind of vernacular door that you see here on your screen uh, that she, I, and, and pretty much everyone 
uh, had walked through for decades. Again, still mindlessly believing in the collective wisdom that whatever, you know, original fabric from the building was long gone. She still does not know exactly why it looked different on this particular day, uh, but she does remember saying to herself, that looks like a really old door. And are those hand planed planks? And is it possible that this door has through some miracle survived from the first period? And we started looking at it and sure enough, that you don't see them on this photograph. Uh, you have to get sort of close to it, but yeah, there are handmade plain planing marks on these planks. And it's like, who in the world puts a hand plane door on a 20th century renovation? That's just kind of bizarre. So of course, to find out, there's one person we always call first, and uh, I'm sure she's worked at, in fact, I think I know she's worked at Dunbarton House, along with just about everywhere between here and Mars, uh, doing pain analysis. Uh, um, Susan Buck is our high priestess of pain analysis throughout up and down the East Coast. Um, but, and she's always the first phone call when it comes to any type of archeological, or excuse me, architectural uh, uh, investigation. And Dr. Buck uh, is based out of Williamsburg. She is the first step in any type of forensic analysis when it comes to better understanding historical structures. I don't know what we do without her. She actually did her thesis on the on R. Aiken Red House. Uh, so she's always had uh, a close relationship with HCF and we've always had a close relationship with her. But besides that, so what we ended up doing was calling Susan and say, hey, you know, can we see the report from when you did pain analysis on the back, on the outbuilding, on the former kitchen house, you know, that's now office space. And her response really, you know, surprised us. Oh, no, we, we never did any scrapings back there. And that surprised us and kind of surprised her when we started talking about it. And so uh, we asked her to come down, which she did. And with scalpel and scope in hand, she started, you know, picked away at miscellaneous places on this door and found out that yes, this door was indeed original. And we did have a piece of data to sort of go on, to take a closer, uh, more in-depth and certainly more, I think, inclusive uh, study into what, uh, uh, what heretofore had, let's be honest, was only half the story. We were telling, we were giving tours on the main house, and this was an afterthought of this build, this outbuilding, which was so critical uh, to not only the lives of the enslaved, but the whole general workings of this property. Uh, and to overlook it, I got to say, at this time, once we found that, was a little, in, a little embarrassing, but something that we have uh, really sort of owned up to, and in the way that we have. Um, undertaken this project with as much um, as much force and as much attention and as much dedication as we possibly can. So, in any case, back to uh, what I was talking about. Once Susan had um, uh, sort of determined this, we very quickly surmised uh, that um, we started peeling away more and more bits and pieces to the part where we kind of got obsessed with it. Uh, the first, I think, section that we peeled away was about a square foot chunk of wall space and, and orig that original plaster walls survived in every room of the kitchen house, uh, which had been perfectly encapsulated by plasterboard installed in the early 20th century. Uh, and this was, you know, all the evidence we needed before deciding that, yeah, we're, we're going to have to rip this place up. And so we have removed all the uh, original, or excuse me, we have removed all the uh, modern material um, to discover that the what, whoever or whenever this a lot of over the time of these renovations, uh, nothing original was removed. I don't know if you want to call it dumb luck or, or what, but it just kind of went all the new stuff just simply went over the top of the old stuff uh, here. Um, we, you know, expansive original wall with lime washes, a uh, patch of what turned out to be a modern raised wood floor. Um, uh, was you know, underneath that raised wooden modern floor was the wide plank first period floorboards, floorboards with their last coat of 19th century whitewash intact. And so with uh, so much of this original fabric uncovered, we were able to get our first sense of the space as it was during the period of enslavement. And, and I have to say it became kind of emotional for us uh, that we were seeing this in a whole new light, uh, in a whole new way. And suddenly this whole building for us changed dramatically. This was no longer an office space or a sterile, 
you know, boring reception, gift shop, office, whatever you want to call it. It, 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 it started to breathe for us in a, in a very meaningful way. Um, so as we started peeling back things, it was, you know, shedding light for the first time that we had seen uh, these, these original washes and what uh, the direct, uh, uh, the direct view for uh, for us and what the original material as it related to the, the period of enslavement during the Russells, uh, first period that is. Um, so from that point on, as I said, the rooms took on a, a very different feel. These were uh, like I said, all around uh, living spaces. The heartbeat begins to begins to emerge here. And it was also about this time uh, as removal of modern materials continued that a whole new chapter of this undertaking began. One we didn't necessarily expect. We were looking at this architecturally um, and it was suggested to us by one of our, um, uh, one of our team members like, hey, you know, as you're, as you're peeling all this stuff back, you may want, it's gonna take some time. It may be kind of gross, but it'd probably be worth it to set up a table somewhere. And as this crud sort of comes out with the new material and what's been entrapped in these uh, spaces over time, uh, it may be worth it to do some screening, kind of sift through it, see if there's anything um, of note in there. That was the best advice we ever got. Um, it, it was uh, as we remove these modern materials uh, that a whole new chapter in this undertaking began. And it's also in uh, one of the upstairs quarters that we came across our very first rat's nest. Uh, now, if you don't know anything about rats, <laughs> I am proud to be the first to enlighten you. Uh, if, if you don't remember me for anything else, maybe you can remember me for this. Um, uh, the uh, rats can live their whole lives in about a 50 foot radius from their nest. And that is if they don't have reason to leave. Uh, and this is a kitchen house. Uh, so there's plenty of food there. They've got no reason to go anywhere. Um, it, in this area, in this 50 foot radius that I'm talking about, they tend to gather items and from what they don't eat, they pack tightly into a single spot, build a nest out of this stuff, and then urinate all over everything. Turns out, uh, who'd have thought rat urine is a beautiful preservative. It creates a very anaerobic environment. It, it dries, it crystallizes, and it turns their nest into these perfectly preserved time capsules um, for a group of people whose daily lives uh, the enslaved I'm talking about, uh, the, their daily lives are missing from the written record. And so like the enslaved at the Russell House, uh, these rats nests really became valuable in, uh, we had the architecture and the floorboards and everything I've talked about before, but what was coming out of these rats nests, perfect, almost perfectly preserved anyway, was the real humanizing uh, elements of the people who were, who were, who were actually there. Uh, we spent many days combing through uh, the debris and removing artifacts, and from these rat and from these rats' nests, we found uh, buttons, stockings, marbles, straight pins, crab shells, scraps of newspaper, textile remnants, all manner of fruit and plant material, hundreds of bones uh, from butchered animals, glasswares, um, just uh, ceramics. It goes on and on and on, all collected again and stored. Uh, in 19th century rat's nests uh, for us to discover years and years and years later. The most immediate exciting finds um, were actually two small fragments of paper, which came of, actually turns out came from the exact same rat's nest. Um, one was a minuscule bit of newspaper with the name, unusual name of Crookshank on it, which was quickly matched and digitized uh, uh, to the digitized original dated uh, November 1838. You, you could enter Crookshank on the Library of Congress and this popped up almost immediately. Not too many Crookshanks out there in South Carolina, fortunately for us. Um, so this able, was able to context the rat's nest to 1838. Now the good news about that is, and I, my first question, maybe your first question was, well, how do you know, you know, that another rat didn't come in there and, and drop this off? And, you know, how do you contextualize everything based on one newspaper. Again, I, I in this uh, in this project, I think I've learned more about rats than, than, than I ever, ever want to know. But uh, once a rat's nest is established and 
peed upon. Uh, that's it. There, another rat won't come along and move in or cannibalize that nest to use it its own, and it kind of stays there. So you can pretty much guarantee, a set, except for maybe a couple of mice who might come and pinch one or two things, um, that everything in that one particular rat's nest, uh, because of their preservation method, is from that rat's lifespan, which however long that was, three to four to five years. Um, so anyway, what we have is an 1838 newspaper, which carries us into uh, the next fragment of paper, uh, which was this um, printed, uh, it's got letters printed in neat rows. And this is a small scrap from a uh, 1830s reading primer, probably Quaker. We haven't completely nailed that down yet. Um, and this is an, this is immediate, was of immediate interest to us because of the 1830s context, uh, we're right in the thick of the newly passed of 1832, uh, South Carolina slave codes, um, when it was made severely punishable by law uh, for enslaved people to read and write or to learn such a thing. So this small fragment, combined with a huge amount of other reading materials we found in the walls, clearly show you know that, that someone who lived in the kitchen house was literate, and what's more, they were possibly teaching others at a time when this was illegal and like I said, punishable. Um, whether or not the Russell family condoned this illegal practice, we may never know, uh, but knowing it took place um, certainly demonstrates that even though the Russell family could undeniably enslave bodies, it does, it, they could not uh, hope to enslave the minds of those that they kept in bondage. So along with papers, uh, this short length of cloth was another uh, fairly eye-opening uh, find for us. Again, preserved well enough in a rat's nest uh, with five intact brass buttons. Uh, it's one of the first artifacts we actually pulled from the walls. We were finding a lot of papers first and then things a little bit more material like this started showing up. Uh, I'm pleased to say we have since determined it to be a fragment of a waistcoat uh, or waistcoat from the 1830s uh, made of black worsted wool uh, with a black silk lining and the brass buttons that you see. And we're, uh, based on comparisons of other extant pieces, we are fairly comfortable now in saying that this was very likely the uniform of the, the livery uh, of an enslaved butler, body servant, or possibly, uh, possibly footman. Uh, records of such livery can be found in assorted estate inventories around the American South, certainly in Charleston from time to time. Uh, Charlestonian Mary Pringle, for example, not really affiliated with the Russell House, but she does describe at times, um, just one example that I'm using, uh, included a, a livery coat, uh, or rights rather in her inventory, quote, a livery coat and vest, four cravats, and two pocket handkerchiefs. In addition to four shirts, two or three pairs of pants, three vests, and two coats. So it's exciting for us to sort of be able to um, interpret this fragment into something that was um, uh, a serious uh, piece of equipment uh, for a working wealthy household such as this. We have no surviving records of clothing allotments at the Russell House, uh, but the practice was common, like I said, so uh, this surviving fragment is from one of those allotments, like what we see uh, with, uh, with the Pringle family existing in the Russell House. So not everything we found was this obvious uh, and certainly not as big. I'm actually kind of surprised this one didn't slip through the cracks on us because uh, fortunately we found more than one. Um, this uh, tiny, tiny coral bead, uh, so far the smallest, maybe the most poignant piece we've uncovered uh, and was it's probably part of a piece of jewelry, a very expensive one at that. Uh, coral, it's an exotic material important to Charleston, uh, usually coming out of the Southern Mediterranean regions. Um, and it is a, a, a typically, not always, but typically in jewelry form, most often associated with children, children's pieces, whether those are necklaces, teethers, rattles. Uh, in the 18th and 19th century, we find complete examples of these. And coral seemed to have, at the time anyway, the belief that these had protective spiritual or medicinal medicinally protective properties um so is you know that gets us into an entire different sort of avenue and i, I think it's safe to let your mind wander in situations like this an expensive coral piece of jewelry ending up 
back uh, in, in, a, in a space that was occupied by the enslaved. Um, is there, what kind of intermingling is going on there? Uh, and if, if this is indeed a children's piece, um, that is uh, worthy of investigation as well. Um, another noteworthy and really, um, oops, excuse me, sorry. Uh, and really another noteworthy worthy and all around unexpected discovery uh, was directly under our feet as this work was going on. It was so caked with crud though, uh, that it blended in perfectly with the rest of the place. In fact, we were, we were um, sad to say, we actually, you know, we're, walk, we're, we're literally walking over this uh, because it had, it had sort of camouflaged itself underneath all the, the dirt and, and, and buildup. Um, as, uh, as, as a friend of mine says, if, if it had been a snake, it had bit us. And uh, so sandwiched flat between the first period floor and a modern floor was in fact a two foot by three foot fragment of so far the only 19th century floor cloth that we've ever discovered in situ in Charleston. Um, and again, its survival is fairly remarkable. Now the location where this was found is noteworthy. As you can see, it's right sort of in front of the laundry hearth here atop the original floorboards uh, but because uh, this area where Susan is kneeling and, and scrubbing was uh, actually be had become very worn uh, and thin from at least 100 years of laundry fires uh, as embers escaped and threw out and went beyond the hearth and landed on this section of floorboard, uh, the, the slow burning and, and singeing eventually weakened that floor to the point where repairs were in order. Uh, the worn spot was first covered with a patch uh, of what, uh, which you cannot see here, unfortunately, we have removed it to get to the floor cloth. Uh, but it kind of clued us in the worn spot covered with a patch of uh, recycled embossed tin, a repurposed sheet of tin where it came from, we weren't sure. And that sheet of tin was then covered over with uh, this fragment of floor cloth. Clearly, um, uh, which you can see sort of the pattern emerging here, uh, the arrow, uh, this is what it looked like when we first pulled it up off the floor, obviously cut down. This would have been a 10 by 10 uh, piece originally, but with uh, uh, floor claws. And if, you, if, um, if you're unfamiliar with floor claws, I've heard these described, and I, I kind of like the description enough to where I use it too. Uh, and I give credit to Colonial Williamsburg for teaching me this term, but we look at this as 18th century, 19th century linoleum. These are high traffic areas are usually, sorry, used in high traffic areas like the entry hall, which would have been uh, sort of the waiting room for Nathaniel Russell's merchant dealings before uh, be, before being entered into the uh, inner sanctum of the home um, or the uh, the, uh, the market office anyway. And so um, uh, as these wear out, you know, they're replaced, they get trampled on, they get, well, well, they're literally walked upon for years and years and years to the point where they have to be replaced fairly often. Uh, and so as that happens, fragments are, in the case of the Russell House anyway, uh, the fragments were cut off and used uh, as more decorative or, or, or elements within uh, the outbuildings. Um, and the kitchen and laundry, you know, perfect example because this was still sitting there directly under our feet. Now, um, Clearly, I think as you can see, as I mentioned, this this fragment was once part of a larger, grand, and high style piece uh, that certainly, uh, without question, I think, began its life in the main house. Um, and sometime when the modern floor at the of the of these renovations in our outbuilding were installed, sometime around 1908, um, the carpenters, like I said, just just nailed the new floor down directly on top of the floor cloth fragment, and and. and left it in situ there for us to find again many years later. Initial uh, cleaning uh, did bring out a bit of a pattern uh, that we're still sort of taking our time with. But most noteworthy, um, even better, with further examination, we reveal that uh, what we found just, just wasn't one floor cloth, it was actually two that had become sort of pressed together and melded together uh, through the high heat of the laundry hearth. Um, the top fragment, which you see on your left, is probably about 1845, based on uh, pigment analysis. The bottom fragment is much earlier, maybe even first period. Um, Microanalysis suggests this earlier cloth, which you see this green key pattern sort of peeking out from back there, um, is painted uh, with a deeply colored orange-red ground pigment 
uh, with a design outlined in carbon-based black ink or bone black. Uh, the top cloth on your left consists of a coarse hemp or jute backing, uh, uh, followed by, again, underneath the deep brick red colored base coat. Um, two layers of yellow paint in a design layer that includes zinc-based white pigment. pigment. Uh, that last one import, is important because the presence of zinc, and I'm talking about the top layer on your left here, uh, dates it to about 1845 or later. The bottom bone black and that, uh, that bright red ochre, uh, the pigments, pigments there date this from, from much, much uh, from, from earlier, probably. I said first period, that's probably not entirely accurate. We're probably getting into the 1820s perhaps. Uh, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, so where, in the interest of time, and Lord knows I could go on and on and on, this is one of my favorite subjects, but um, uh, a question you're probably asking, so this has been going on, we've been, we've been, you know, plotting away at this and taking it slowly and trying to, you know, absorb, this was, this happened for us very quickly. Uh, we uncovered a lot of this very quickly. We found a lot of these materials very quickly. And so we were having to really, in a tough way for us, uh, really stamp on the brake pedal because we were, uh, I think what, what happens, and especially in my former life as a, as a museum curator, is that uh, we, you know, we get this sort of curatorial disease, like, oh, we've got all this new stuff and we can make an exhibit and we can chew on this thing in and just cram it out there and get it, you know, and, and, and make it a presentation and, uh, you know, share our discoveries. And that for us was not, we realized, fortunately, uh, we realized very, very early on that this was going to take a lot more work than just some assembly line exhibition to put on exhibit. Uh, we realized um, that uh, a lot more work was going to have to entail what the lives and the social uh, uh, material that we could decipher from these items to, to what stories the, they were. Now that for us became, and, ha, and is still um, a, a very important aspect of this entire project. We realized that while we can tell you everything there is to know about the Russell family in the main house, there's only four of them. There are likely 12 to 18 enslaved in this space that we've only recently uncovered. We don't even know the names. So we are taking as much time and resources as we can and as, as slowly as we can to make sure that this isn't another some kind of rushed thing to cram in uh, uh, to, 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 to present something that quite honestly, we still have much, much, much left to, to learn about. Um, so our next step in this was a cataloging and digitization of all these artifacts. Um, this past May, um, we, uh, we, I'm sorry, so uh, although COVID has slowed things down for us, it has been picking back up lately. Uh, we realized um, that to give our kitchen house and our outbuilding uh, some more context for architecturally, that field work was needed. Uh, to go around and survey as many extant dependency structures as we could. Uh, we are in the process of completing our first set of 10 sites that are around town. It's not easy. Uh, and we are very fortunate to have this grant funded by the Donnelly Foundation. But a lot of, <clears throat> as you can guess, a lot of these outbuildings are being demolished, gutted, repurposed. Uh, there are a few still out there, however, and um, careful study of just one of these structures uh, reveals an immense amount of information, uh, architectural and otherwise, that can help us, again, put the Russell House Kitchen House in better context as we slowly move toward uh, ultimate reinterpretation. Uh, this past May, uh, we did some archaeology, and we did it in a fairly uh, inconvenient space. This is not archaeology. We just sort of did out in the what we believe to be the workyard. Um, we we actually wanted we we crawled into the crawl space underneath the kitchen house. We had about a two foot clearance uh, to get back to this space and began um, began uh, excavating some some different areas back there. Uh, here is Corey Hayward with Drayton Hall. Uh, uh, it was kind of nice because the deeper the pit got, the more headroom we got <laughs> from the live wires and the sewer pipes and everything else. 
uh, as that we wanted really wanted to make sure, and it was worth our time to make sure that this cellar space, and as you can see, I'm using the term cellar very loosely, that this space was not used for anything other than storage. And archeology span helped us prove that indeed uh, there wasn't a heck of a lot going down or going on down here other than storage, uh, which was nice to sort of scratch that off our list to make sure we, we found evidence of whitewash uh, and, and stucco on a wall, which made us think, hmm, that's maybe perhaps worth investigating because why do you get a finished surface like that in a space like this? Uh, fortunately, archeology, span uh, the, the bit that we did back in May uh, helped us conclude that this was indeed a, so a storage space. Um, the first few days of that dig revealed nothing too surprising. You know, there were exact, there were plenty of artifacts, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of faunal material as well, but all of it was exactly what you'd expect to find uh, beneath a space formerly used, uh, or beneath a space that was a kitchen and laundry above straight pins, broken ceramics, uh, random food remains, chicken bones, fish scales surfaced regularly, at least in these early layers, a lot of coal, um, uh, coal seemed to be the, of the later 19th century. And we have records from when the uh, uh, Sisters of Mercy were in this property of how they were storing coal down there. So that one, we had enough coal, I think, to, if uh, we really thought of getting it away at one point because there was so much just shovels full of it early. Now things changed dramatically as the unit got deeper and deeper. By the time um, we get into an 1830s and 1840s, sorry, 1840s and 1830s layer, uh, things started to begin to change. Uh, here we found a few personal artifacts um, or a few personal items, I should say, the, the locket on, or the medallion on the left, which coincidentally, that is a coral bead underneath that glass capsule. So I'm going to let my mind wander here a little bit and wonder if this is a matching set uh, to that smaller bead that we found. And, you know, a couple of toothbrushes, nothing too massively remarkable. But again, once we got further down, that's when the beef bones showed up. And when I say beef bones, I mean hundreds of them. Uh, to they are all butchered. They're all uncut. As you see, these nice clean cuts across. Those are you know cleaver and saw marks. Um, so we really forcibly turned to the food ways of what's going on here at the Russell House. Uh, why so many? Why such a dense concentration in a specific layer of beef bones? I think we ended up with something like 42 trash bags full of beef bones. And, um, uh, and these were all, like I said, butchered cuts. No vertebra, uh, no teeth, no skulls, no horns. This was all um, hard cuts that were being, or, or excuse me, edible cuts uh, that were being stored down here or, or dumped down here. Is it a drainage issue? Is it a, it's a, is it a fill project? Uh, and that's a question that we're, we're still sort of dealing with uh, to try to answer why all, I mean, it was more bone than dirt at one point as far as the shovel, the shovel falls coming out. Um, so that was, it's, it's interesting to sort of, you know, again, what, what's going on here? I can tell you for sure, they were not vegetarians. That's as far as I've gotten in this research so far though, but we've got a team of archeologists working on this that we will hopefully have some sort of hypothesis of what to go on here. Um, so as I mentioned, there is, uh, here's, yeah, here's one of the garbage bags of, of, of beef bones that we're currently going through and cleaning. Um, this, and so yeah, so um, and you can see these 1830s and 1840s layers of just the massive amount of beef bone uh, packed into these very small spaces. And why is it put there? Uh, why this one particular layer? There's no other real trash or, or, or remnants included in this. Uh, every bucket full we pulled out was mostly beef bone and nothing else. There are no real ceramics mixed in, no, um, no other material. It's, it's, it's quite strange for us actually so far, but um, Sharon, I'm happy to come back next year and go back over this and see what we've come, uh, see what conclusions we've come to. There is still um, so much to do and learn. Uh, and quite frankly, we don't completely know yet where or how this project will, will end. Um, it is the most compelling aspect of the Kitchen House project or the stories of the enslaved people that we quite literally are, are uncovering. Uh, we have in uh, recognizing that 
we need to know, we, we can tell you a lot about the uh, architecture, we can tell you a lot about the art, the artifacts, we can tell you a lot about the archaeology. Um, we cannot tell you the human stories that were there. And that's something that's very important to us. And that is our next step to sort of, uh, or not sort of, but to definitively uh, find out what that is going to entail. We have, we are now in conversation with, uh, uh, with starting uh, a genealogical project, a descendants project, uh, because we would like to identify at the very least um, uh, what, uh, certainly in the, in the, in the, in the scope of descendants, uh, who uh, may have different uh, uh, perspectives on this. And you get that through descendants projects. And we would like to have uh, those, uh, those individuals in on the front end of this before we start the reinterpretation phase. Um, so that is, like I said, where we are now. Uh, we are looking again to do you know, redemptive stories uh, preser preserving a tangible um, and better illustrate, um, you know, the, these very personal things that were uh, certainly important to the site as a whole. And it is helping us immensely in telling the whole story. You know, when we first, uh, when we first discovered this project and when we first really sank our teeth into this thing, it was, oh, you know, it's going to alienate, uh, it's going to alienate our, 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 our standard visitors. And I was like, well, you know, and my predecessor and I were very quick to say, well, sounds to me like we've been, you know, alienating a lot of visitors for the past 50 years because we had this entire outbuilding here that wasn't being interpreted, wasn't being represented, what you know, wasn't even being studied. Uh, so who's alienating who? Um, secondly, is well, we would we would, you know, really turn off a lot of funders. I can tell you when we first started this uh, and first started, you know, promoting or uh, explaining what was going on here. The money flowed in. We raised ninety thousand dollars in about three months uh, for to for for different areas of this project. Um, we received uh, we I don't know how many grants we applied for, but we I know we received almost all of them. Uh, so I think it's the first time in my professional career I can actually say I, I'm working on a project <laughs> that's flush with cash. Um, but that will quickly as we get into this genealogy project. Um, uh, that's certainly going to be needed. And it's going to take some time. Uh, it is going to be expensive, and it's going to uh, 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 take a lot of patience on a lot of people's parts. Uh, but it is worth doing. Uh, it is. It is certainly not an option, really, for us at this point. It is very silly, uh, as I said, to 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 look at things structurally and materially without examining the mental uh, mental uh, mental aspects of these kinds of things. Thank you all very much. I've gone a little bit over time. I apologize for that, but uh, I think we do have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, to share it in the Dumbarton House, thank you so, so very much for having me. It's, it's, it's awesome to be a part of y'all's organization and to be in service of it. And so uh, uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, if you're in Charleston, please come see us. Uh, we will, uh, the, the kitchen house uh, as it exists now with all the materials stripped away, uh, is uh, is tourable. You can walk through it. We have sort of a floating walkway that goes across it where you can, and an audio tour that explains a lot of what's going on over there. And it is this will be an evolving uh, interpretation of this space as more information comes to light over the next few years. Thank you so much, Graham. This has been a fascinating talk, and it's been so cool to see those findings up close um, in those great photos. It's so important to digitize this work, as you were saying. Um, and it's so great to hear about a discovery that was made that a lot of sites lack. Um, you know, you, you kind of mentioned this, how historically um, the preservation movement in the U.S. has been primarily invested in maintaining white spaces. And uh, for much of American history, little has been done to protect the black spaces and other spaces that were historically significant to people of color. So like for instance, Dumbarton House doesn't have a kitchen um, related to a moving of the house in 1915, but a lot of other historic house museums also don't have kitchens. They were turned into like visitor centers and things like that because they just weren't the focus in the 20th century, as you said. So, yeah, so it's great. I'm sorry, to go ahead. I'm sorry to cut you off. No, I was just going to say it's great to see that kind of being reversed a bit at the Nathaniel Russell House. And I was wondering if you, you know, could speak to how sites who maybe don't have such amazing finds can do something to make up for the disparities in preservation. It starts with archaeology, uh, I think. Um, now, for 20 years, I worked next to 
an archaeo my office at the Charles Museum was next door to Martha Zier, who was South Carolina's archaeologist. And so a lot of my knowledge of archaeology really came from her. We could actually hear each other through our wall. So I was privy to all of her phone calls and all that stuff. Um, so a lot of that rubbed off on me. Martha and I are still very close. She was the one who quartered back to archaeology a couple of months ago. Um, but that is for those of you for for sites that may not have the the you know the the, the physical remnants of this archaeology can uncover those things very quickly archaeology a lot of people uh, misunderstand archaeology that artifacts are important in archaeology but they are there to give it context uh, what you are looking for are variations in the soil stains in the soil that tells you where a hearth was or where a post hole was and, uh, as as material like brick and wood are put into or you know, rest in the soil it changes the proteins and the buildup and the the uh, anatomic whatever you want to call it i'm not i've taken one biology class my whole life i can't get into the whole jargon but it's um but it's uh it does change the 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 makeup of the dirt so you can even if you find no artifacts at all uh archaeology can uncover the whole you know architectural footprint of what these places were so i would definitely start there we do have uh what unfortunately we, it's not so new anymore i'm still fascinated by it but um uh, ground penetrating radar is is more available now than it's ever been uh, and that is a good first step of sort of deciphering where might be uh, some of these items uh, or some of these uh, foundations and, and, and ghosts of buildings uh, can still be discovered uh, that's one I will add to what you were saying earlier though Sharon one when we, we kicked off our, our field work you know going around and documenting these outbuildings was a total uh, kind of a surprise to us, and this is not something we planned on doing initially. Uh, when we started uncovering a lot of our architectural material, uh, we found some confusing architectural traits there. Uh, and we said, well, let's go back and check HABs and Department of the Interior and find, let's go check, you know, the files uh, to see what catalogs are out there. And uh, there weren't any. And so this whole, like you said, there was a whole decades and generations worth of attention paid to the main house. And so this side, this side project that's been birthed from our kitchen house about going around in Charleston and just documenting uh, outbuildings in the way that Habs would have done, we're following their standards. In fact, I may actually hire Habs to do our kitchen house, um, but, but is to, to, is really kind of eye-opening for us that, wow, over the course of the entire uh, time that, that these outbuildings have just been completely forgotten and because of that. And the image that I showed you, case in point, the image I showed you was a outbuilding, um, the one with the older photo in front of the newer, in front of the more modern structure, well, the structure that had kind of survived over time there. That was a, a kitchen and laundry from a house in Georgetown, South Carolina, which is about an hour north of here. Uh, we were, we got in there, we recorded it, we photographed it. Um, uh, we got most of the measured drawings done and a week later it was gutted and turned into an airbnb so that's the urgency uh, of recording some of these outbuildings to make sure there's as, as much uh, original data as we can as we can possibly record before as you said they get retrofitted they get changed um, perfectly understandable um, but uh, we're really getting a late start here so whatever uh, whatever efforts we can make to make sure these are uh, cataloged and, and, and used in a meaningful way has become very important to us. Absolutely. And that's you know, another, another good reminder that we learn from other sites. And so what our site has um, may, you know, the gaps we have may be reflected in the things that other sites do have. So um, kind of doing a broader look across the field. Um, so have you learned things from like the dependency survey that you can bring to bear on your own site? Yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of going at it very slowly in a way. And when I say slowly, I don't mean like, you know, we're just, we did nine sites in nine days uh, last last month. Um, we are, um, um, we're, we're trying to, to bring in as many as budget or try to catalog as many as budget that will allow. And even if they have been renovated, there's still some original data that can be found. Um, property owners have been very welcoming and very uh, uh, curious and very enthusiastic 
about us trying to find out more of, of what might this might have originally worked. Some are very much intact, some haven't been altered at all, uh, at least in a way that um, uh, that is, uh, you know, that, that I can't say they're you know, in its original form, uh, but some are kind of like we've run into a couple of cases where some new material was just placed over old material um, and, you know, a closet just never got painted. Um, Ed Chapel was our leading architect on that. Well, actually, Susan Buck's husband, uh, who was unfortunately uh, passed away uh, during, during really in the, in the thick of this work. Um, but he was able to find, you know, you go in and paint a closet, but it's way down in the corner where the brush doesn't reach. There may be this tiny little, you know, hint of lime wash there that we were able to get data from. So it's, um, it's it's good we are and then now and then we're doing some just you know general calculations and averages like the kitchen house was on average from at least the ones we looked at a certain number of feet away from the main house the laundry is typically the furthest part away so we're kind of picking that low hanging fruit as well just because it's never been as far as strawson goes it's never really been cataloged so even little things like that uh, are, mm -hmm. are, 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 uh, we're making notes on Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned how artifacts provide context to like the archaeological information that we're finding. And, um, you know, it's all about putting pieces together wherever you can find them. So you mentioned how there's not a lot of written sources. Um, you don't even know the names of the enslaved people who lived at the site. Um, what are your next steps uh, in terms of uncovering those human stories? How will you start with um, like a genealogical project if you don't have the names to begin with? So we uh, have asked for help <laughs> in a big way. Uh, we're again, incredibly fortunate in the sense that, uh, in a way that um, we are, the city rather is about, a, is about a year away from opening the International African American Museum here in Charleston. In that museum, and we're, we're already um, in discussions with them, there's going to be a genealogical sort of center. Now the genealogy, the genealogist, uh, there's two um, that are sort of building this for them, have graciously agreed and actually came more or less came to us about this kitchen house project because this was kind of fit into their line of work as well. So one of those genealogists, I don't think she minds me mentioning it, her name is Tony Carrier. Um, that name may sound familiar to some of you. She was the one picked or, or commissioned by the White House to do um, uh, to carry out Michelle Obama's genealogy that that uh, did her lineage back to South Carolina. Um, I heard about that, and I knew she was coming to Charleston, and she was actually ended up being a friend of a friend. So when um, uh, when we have sort of approached each other about this, and I got a feel of how enthusiastic she was, I said, "Well, guess what you're going to be doing in <laughs> in a way that you know." That, uh, so we kind of got her on board with this. She connected us to Dr. Shelley Murphy, who is in charge of the University of Virginia uh, project, uh, Tracing the Enslaved, that were a part of that building process as well. So this is where we're starting. Uh, we have the two people that, um, uh, we have two people uh, that we are, are partnering with, but we're also um, at this early stage, and rather going through data, uh, cultural landscape reports, cultural uh, historic structure reports, which we've all have commissioned at both of our properties and trying to uncover that uh, as best we can to find out, uh, you know, how much data is there and can that lead to, to deeper study? So it's really sort of a, a, a surface examination at this point. It's, it's, we may not uh, be able to find, uh, you know, it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility that we will strike out. Uh, that would be very sad, but it's certainly a possibility. I will say uh, a, another sort of key interest on this is we have already identified uh, the, uh, a, a few of the enslaved that belong to Sarah Hopton. Now that's important because Sarah Hopton at age 35 marries Nathaniel Russell and brings those enslaved into the marriage. So even if we're not too familiar with the uh, Nathaniel Russell side, we can uh, trace a few, a few things with Sarah Hopton. The family that comes in after the Russells in the 1850s has a very strong catalog, uh, uh, excuse me, inventory, uh, estate record, excuse me, of, uh, of, of their enslaved names, uh, what surnames they took after emancipation and what their occupations were 
uh, inside the house when when they were when they were there for a very short time. Uh, the second family is uh, the Austins. William Austin comes in after the Russell family, uh, and he is there. Their family is there from 1858 to he dies in 1862, and the the uh, the widow's not there very much longer. But they have extensive and very detailed estate records. So, as 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 I'm learning uh, from Tony and Shelley that these even though they're little little tidbits of information, they can, in ways, uh, slowly get you back to, to first period information. Absolutely. It's great to hear about the avenues you can go down. Um, it is 202, but if I can ask just two more questions. Um, we have a lot in the chat, so I, I want to make sure we get to some of them. And, uh, um, let's say, yeah, please um, share. You, you, you can, anyone who's listening or, or watching, uh, please feel free to email me. Uh, you can get that uh, from Charity. You can look on Historic Charleston Foundation's website and just email me directly. And I'll, I'll be glad to get back to you if, if, if we don't get to you today. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. No, thank you for that offer. Um, so we've got a couple questions about um, interpretation and kind of sharing this information with the public. And you've said how the house is open to the public and people can kind of walk over it. But um, And also you're still in the data gathering stages, but are there any plans for sharing this information in new and creative ways, or maybe even capturing the emotional moment that you all felt when you kind of made these discoveries. How can you share those moments um, of discovery with the public? Have you, have you guys thought about that at all? Yeah, we're, we're debating that actually. We have some very in-depth discussions. Um, our president and CEO, um, my boss, he and I bat a lot of things off of each other as far as, you know, our mission of the Nathaniel Russell House has always been to restore it. And I mentioned this earlier in the talk was, let's restore this to, you know, we pick the first period, we restore it for the first period, we study and study and study uh, and research and research and research to get this house, you know, like I think I mentioned, you know, move in day uh, ready with original paint colors and whatever uh, uh, original data we can reinterpret. Do we do that with the kitchen house and the laundry house and with the quarters? Because there's very bright lime wash paint back there. There's very decorative architectural window surrounds and, and molded wood and uh, transom windows. And so we can restore that in the same way we restore the main house. It's gonna look nice. It's gonna be nice. Is that the right message to send? If you walk past there without knowing this backstory, it's like, ah, oh, you know, this is they're just part of the family. And that's not the message we need to send. As you said, we can look at things physically, but a key ingredient in all this is going to be looking at things mentally. Uh, and that's that's hard. And that's something we're really facing here uh, is how to interpret this in a way that is relatable, but meaningful but really gets the psychological point across that this was a, as my predecessor said, a beautiful prison. Um, and how how is that explained? And how do you do that? And that's something we're, we're talking about almost daily is, is what that's ultimately gonna, gonna how, does, how does that look? How do we do that? Absolutely, it's not a question that's easily answered for sure. Um, and speaking of questions that are not easily answered, my last question for you is a big one, um, kind of bringing our discussion into the, the current events of the past year or so. Uh, so this work obviously began before George Floyd's murder and the events of last summer, but has the Historic Charleston Foundation changed its interpretation or the way it approaches these new discoveries in any way since then or other events that occurred closer to home, like the tragedy at the Mother Emanuel Church, which occurred back in 15. Yeah, that was our awakening. Uh, was the was the Mother Emanuel uh, shooting? Um, the Aiken Red House is uh, two blocks from there, or three blocks from there. So what we discovered, and, and through uh, no, and I, I, we can't take any. We would, we don't take credit for this. Uh, the Aiken Red House, because of its preserved nature and because of the outbuildings that are still very readable and visitable there, that sort of became this um, gathering place uh, for after the shooting of this kind of, you know, this is this is worthy of a lot more attention. Um, uh, we opened it up a few different times after that, you know, we didn't 
charge admission or anything for, for, for entryway, uh, was used uh, as a reflective uh, space uh, for a while. So um, the, 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 the George Floyd thing was different for us in the sense that, of course, that, um, that occurred during COVID. And, and we weren't, and I'm not you know, making excuses, but we, our houses weren't open at that period. In fact, our houses don't, don't open up again until almost, you know, uh, uh, really almost uh, uh, 10 months later. Um, so uh, we have, you know, one thing we did do in the wake of that during that interim period uh, was we went back and listened to our app. We listened to our audio tours. And even our, even though we made sure, um, we just wanted to revisit those and, and make sure that we were uh, telling the whole story that we weren't still, you know, leaning towards one side or the other to make sure that um, uh, that both structures, or, or the carriage building, and or in the case of the Aiken Red House, the, the carriage building, the kitchen, laundry, the quarters, and at the Russell House, the kitchen and laundry, were just as big a part um, as 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 the as the main store. You. We we've understood really since since uh, since 2015 that um, that it's it's one does not one half of the property cannot work and exist without the other and how do those two really uh, how can those uh, be explained in a way uh, that you know uh, are are relatable or are meaningful um, uh, and um, are are recognizable certainly if that makes sense yeah absolutely it does um, well thank you so much graham for the time you spent with us this afternoon this has been a really fascinating presentation and discussion um, and i really appreciate your sharing uh, all of this with us um, and everyone please do remember in two weeks uh, we have another session these continue through september 2nd meredith horsford will be joining us from the dykeman farmhouse museum in new york city so we're going up north um, but we're going to hear uh, how some of these stories you know can be shared in a different site so uh, very interesting and all the recordings will be made on, available on YouTube shortly after they air live. Thank you again so much, Graham. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Have a good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>